Hi everyone and welcome to CCW. Our prayer today is that you would open your hearts to God and know his presence with you. Please join us in worshipping as we lift our voices and our hearts to God today. truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Who stands in the fire 
hearts bowed down in humility before God, whether that is to stand, sit down, or maybe even kneel before Him. loves us, who is merciful, who looks after us and keeps us safe. We give all our praises to you and we sit still in your presence and thank you that we are able to come together here all around all places in this building, in our homes and just to sing to you Lord.
Thank you, Jess and team, for leading us in that time of worship. You have, as Dominique asked, encouraged us to lift our voices and hearts to God in praise and acknowledgement of him. Hi, everyone. It's Pete here. You know, this is a time, as Jesus said, to remember him. A time we share the symbols of bread and wine as a realisation of a spiritual union between us and Christ. A time of communion. I was thinking this morning, I wonder what this time of communion looks like now around our family, our church family. You know, what would it be like if we captured on video all the different household settings right now? What would it reveal? My hope is that it has refreshed our intimacy and our connection with this time we call communion and that we would be inspired by what we see. Human nature, though, suggests to me that what we would see also is that routines have already begun. The same bread each week, the same size, the same cups filled to the same sort of level, and the bread and the cup brought out on the same tray or sat on the same table. Yeah, I wonder what it would be like. But as I said, my hope is that it's fresh, vibrant and meaningful to you. We've just sang these words, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you are my God. And as Jess expressed, you know, these are to set our hearts right before God. But then we went on into the bridge to sing these words, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, this transition or, or transformation that has taken place in our lives, where we find ourselves today knowing the cross as the power of God, is something that we should not take for granted. We need to take note that Paul was writing this to the people of Corinth because they were beginning to drift, to shift from this truth. A friend shared with me this week how that he's not going back to supporting the AFL. We've known uh, each other for about 30 years and footy has always been a regular topic. They shared uh, how recent times have showed them that, uh, that we should be celebrating other people in our lives, other people in our community, the real heroes, the cleaners, the nurses, the doctors, the supermarket workers, the teachers, that these are, and this is what they've realised, they are the frontline people in our lives. Not now, but have always been those people. And so what he's come to realise about AFL footy is that it's not as special as he thought. And particularly, and these are his words, that AFL players are not heroes after all. Now, for me, there's a real connection in what he's saying and about communion in that his heart and mind have seen something that he's never seen before. And uh, the question I've been asking myself about my friend is, what will it take for him to stay true to that conviction? If I ask him in 12 months, is he still not an AFL supporter? I wonder what he's going to say. You know, this is why I believe Jesus, or one of the reasons that Jesus said, remember him. Remember him through these elements that we uh, take each week, the bread and the wine. It keeps in view the transition or the transformation that has happened in our lives. It guards us against the drift away from the cross. You know, it's why Paul later on in Corinthians says, in chapter 11, Examine yourselves. Don't take it for granted. Have a look at your life. The question too we could ask is what are the, the signs 
of a drift or that we are moving away from believing in what the cross has done for us. And Paul actually gives us insight in verse 22, and I actually love this verse. He says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. And then he goes on to say two things about preaching Christ crucified, that first, for the Jews who think of signs and the Greeks who think of wisdom, it is actually a stumbling block to them and foolishness to Gentiles. But to us that actually believe it and know the truth of it, it's become um, both uh, the power of God and the wisdom of God to us. In other words, it's become the way we live our lives. I think about this, you know, how often I've thought, God, if only, if only you could just give me a little sign or if maybe I could just have a bit better understanding, then I would know what to do. Rather than just focus on the fact that the cross and Christ crucified are all that I need. All that I need, they are my cornerstone, they are my salvation. Paul finishes off in verse 30 by saying this, It is because of him, that is God, that you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, that we are in union and communion with Christ, who has become wisdom for us from God. And then Paul does this amazing thing. He actually gives us an insight of what the manifestation of this wisdom of God in our life is. It is this our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. What beautiful words these are for us who have been saved. This is what we remember. This is what Jesus would like us to remember now, that he is our righteousness, our holiness, our redeemer, and that's what we've become because of him. So now as we spend time in the quietness of our homes reflecting, can I encourage you to keep in mind the cross? That is the power of God. And that you remember Jesus, who is to us the wisdom of God, the source of righteousness, holiness and redemption. In a few minutes I'll, I'll return and uh, I will pray uh, for the cup. So I ask you to hold that until then. Thanks. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that today we can know that the cross is full, absolutely full of your power. And we thank you that we have the privilege of knowing that. And we'd ask that you would keep us true 
to the truth of that. We also thank you that today we can remember your son Jesus, the one to us who is representative of all your wisdom and the source of our righteousness, our holiness and our redemption. And we are eternally grateful for that. And so we take this cup now in remembrance of these wonderful things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. not sure about you but I find taking communion together special even when we're at home. Uh, it helps me remember that we are together as a church even though we're in our separate homes. So I hope that's meaningful for you as well. I've got a few reminders of some of the things that are going on for us at the moment. Uh, first of all we have our kids and families special content that uh, hopefully you already know about but if not or if you'd like to put some others onto it just go to our website uh, and to the kids page there and you can find the great stuff that Stacey's been putting together for us. We're also uh, having our youth CCW youth at home every Thursday night and Mandy and her team are doing a great job there and just a reminder of the different times and age groups and if you know someone perhaps a teen who could do with some positive and helpful and safe input at this time then just direct them to Mandy and she'll be able to be able to help out there. King's Cafe is another really exciting space at this time. So the cafe might have closed officially, but it's doing some fantastic stuff at the same time. So they've been selling birthday party packs uh, at home and there's lunch orders on Fridays. They sell their usual coffee beans. And of course, there's the Kings at Home meals. What you might not know yet is that the cafe now has its own section of our website where you can order Kings at Home online. Uh, I've actually put the first order in today, which is exciting, and it's easy to use. Apparently, this is called a soft launch of the website, uh, so it's not being advertised yet, apart from the fact that we now all know about it. And Dana and Lisa would love to get feedback on how it works for you. So if you want to jump online, you'll be able to find out and give feedback on that. I've actually put some screenshots here so we can have a bit of a look at what's happening. So before we saw there was the order now button. There we go. And you can see just below, if you scroll down, you'll see there's a donate button there that you can click on. There's already many people using that at the moment to donate to the cafe and donate not really to the cafe, to people actually who are in need in our community. And so you might know someone and buy a meal for them. But if you don't know someone who's needing some help that way, then you can donate to the cafe and they'll put that straight towards a meal for a family who are in need. And we know of many in our community who need that. So you can do that there. And if we then move on, you can see where we come to the actual web page. When you click on the order, order now, you can choose what you want to order from the menu, pay online and it's nice and easy. So there we go. Kings at home, uh, give us your feedback on how that's going. Also on our web page, if you go to our sermons online page, you'll find not just this service, but our Digging Deeper series. You may remember that Peter Hill began that. I think we just had one session before the lockdowns all happened, but he's been coming in and he's recording these sessions for us and they're excellent material. So it's an overview of the Old Testament. So I encourage you to get online and check that out. There's a new one being released each Tuesday morning. So get online and use this time to actually feed your spirit as well. So as you can see, there's lots going on at CCW, even with all the restrictions. And I'd like now just to turn, turn over to Bev and she's going to lead us in prayer together today. Thanks, Bev.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you today, and I'd just like to ask you now to join us in prayer. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you and praise you for your love and goodness to us. You know that each oh, you know each of us by name, and you have given us the promise of eternal life in heaven with you. We thank you, God, for your majesty, power, strength, and glory, and we thank you for the part of your nature that Danny mentioned last week that is nurturing, loving, compassionate and full of mercy and grace. As the Bible says that the chicks run to the mother hen and she hides them under her wings and protects them, we too can run to you in our troubles and distress and know that you will help us and protect us. This is such a comforting thought, especially at a time like this. Jesus, we thank you that your love for us is so great that you died a cruel death to save us and to allow us to enter into a beautiful relationship with our Heavenly Father. We thank you for our church and we pray that you will bless those who make it possible for us to still join together like this through technology. Thank you that in these difficult times there are still opportunities to worship you to grow in our faith and to serve you. We pray for those in leadership that you will give them wisdom in the tough decisions that have to be made. We pray for Danny, Dominique, Pete and the elders as they lead us through these challenging times. Bless them and give them the wisdom and strength that they need. We remember those who are struggling with the loss of jobs and incomes. Also the parents who are busy trying to work, homeschool and still keep everything going at home. Give them the patience and strength that they need. Lord, please help those who are struggling with loneliness. Help us to be aware of their needs and to reach out to them in kindness. We pray this morning for Stan Hillman who has been unwell and in hospital. And we pray for Stan that he will be feeling better and that you would be with him and Nisha. Be with our youth and children. Bless them and also those who are working to help them stay connected. We pray, Lord, for this pandemic to subside and we pray for those who have lost loved ones. Give them your peace and comfort. Thank you for the curve flattening in Australia, but we pray for healing in other nations too. Please protect all those who are working on the front lines, like the paramedics and the nurses and doctors and the police. Be with them and protect them. Thank you for the work being done through King's Cafe. Thank you for those who are preparing preparing and delivering meals and for people purchasing meals and sharing these meals with others to show that they are loved and cared for. We praise you for people who have been helping financially too where there has been hardship. Lord, as the restrictions are eased, please help us to be responsible and sensitive, being aware that there are those who are more at risk due to other medical issues. Help us to be patient as we long to all be together again. Lord, as we go through these difficult times, we are so grateful that we can find comfort and strength in knowing that you are at work to bring light and hope to us all. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Bev. (coughs) We're starting a new series today and it's called Presence. Denny will be preaching to us in just a moment, but before he does, I'd like you to take a look at this video clip that introduces this theme to us.
Morning, everyone. I was about to say it's great to see you here, um, but I'm not really seeing you here, but it's great that you're joining with us. Uh, oh, Pete's here. Hi, Pete. <laughs> um, when I look down the barrel of these cameras, I'm picturing you, CCW, our family, and even if I haven't met you yet, if you've just uh, jumped in and you're just watching this or you're watching it later, I'm checking it out. Um, our warmest welcome to you. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us. We're glad that you're participating with us in this. And we hope uh, that this word that we're going to share today, this, uh, this message from God uh, to his people through his word, would resonate with you and encourage you and help you in your faith journey. We're starting a new series. Uh, we call it Presence. And we're going to talk uh, through this series about God's presence. God's presence in the good times. God's presence in the hard times. God's presence when he's especially present. His manifest presence. We're going to talk about what it means for us to host his presence as we go about our 24-7 lives. But today we're introducing the theme and we're going to talk about God's presence for the answer to our questions of identity, of uh, questions about our provision, who provides for us, and our guidance, um, who guides us into an uncertain future. I want you to imagine for me that you're 10 years old. You're 10 years old, the desert is your home. The desert's always been your home. And you live in a tent um, with your whole family, not just you, uh, like your extended family. There's quite a few people in your tent, but it's not just you, there's thousands of tents, your whole tribe, and not just your tribe, but everyone. Tents as far as you can see, certainly as far as you can walk out to the horizon, it seems, to a 10-year-old. But you, you're not allowed to wander past the tents at the end of the, the row there, not on your own, but except in the mornings when your whole family goes out, because everyone, every morning goes out, <coughs> outside the, um, the camp there, to get food for the day. It doesn't seem strange at all to you that food for every day is lying on the ground in the desert. It's always been that way for as long as you can remember. And um, The whole community uh, has moved location at least three times that you can remember and plus one other time when you were a baby. It, it's a big deal when everyone moves. That's why your family's always ready. I mean, the place looks settled. Um, you know that, even though the place looks settled, you know that tomorrow could be the day that you're rolling up your bedroll and bringing down the wall hangings and packing up the tent and, and, and helping your family to move on again. And look, you know the story of your community. You've heard over and over how your mum and dad and everyone else used to live in Egypt. They were slaves there. But then God did some amazing things. Um, you would have heard about the plagues that God sent and, and the escape from Pharaoh and, and the time your parents walked through the middle of the sea with a wall of water on each side and they just walked through when God did that amazing uh, miracle to allow all of uh, the people to walk through. Um, so you've heard those stories. Uh, you would have heard about the mountain that was wrapped in cloud and, and thunder and, and the voice of God that everyone was um, freaking out about. That You would have heard that because that happened to your parents and and to maybe even your older brother and, or sister, I don't know, people just a generation ahead of you, you would have heard that, um, but it was all before you were born. You might know too that before you were born, the community tried to get into the land with rivers and green grass and all different foods and drink, but it was all taken by people who were scary and, and big, and so you couldn't get in, and so now the whole community stuck in the desert. Your family, whichever family you have, they have a story about that. Maybe they're excited about God and, and they teach you all the guidelines that Moses, who's the leader, that he teaches from God. Or maybe they're grumpy at God and Moses for this desert and this food and this life and you don't know any different. It's the only food you've known. And you love most of the different food that your mum can make with what you collect every day. But no matter what your family told you there are some things that are just impossible to ignore one there's food every day every day well except for the seventh day because on the sixth day there's twice as much food that you gather and and it lasts for two days because there's no food on the seventh day you go out on the seventh day there's no food but there's twice as much on the sixth day 
And normally the food doesn't last more than one day. You know that because you tried once and you hit a bit and then there was maggots in it in the morning because that's what happened to the food when you tried to keep it, except for the sixth day, which lasted two days to let everybody rest on the seventh day. It's one thing that you can't ignore. There's always food. Someone is providing for you. Moses says that it is God. Uh, everyone knows that Moses goes inside the special tent in the middle of the camp and meets with God and it's easy to tell where the tent is because there's a fire. Well, actually, it's a cloud that looks like it's on fire every single night. That, that, that cloud is fire and during the day, that cloud is a pillar of cloud that sits above that tent. It, it's not strange to you. It's the most normal thing in the world that there would be a tent in the middle of this whole camp and above the tent would be this cloud and at night every night that thing would look like it was on fire like it's as normal as the sun rising or the air that you breathe because it's all you've known when you can't sleep at night and you peer out of your tent there's the fire in the middle of the camp over that tent as dependable as the sun as constant as the air it's normal because every single moment of your life, the cloud and the fire and the food have always been there. And every morning when you get up with everyone else to collect food, everybody takes a glance to just check that the cloud is still there. Because if it moves and when it moves, and it moved something like 42 times across the 40 years, by the way, if it moved, everybody just goes back inside, rolls up their bedrolls, pulls down the wall things that they need, wraps up the rugs, gets their possessions together, strikes the tents and follows the cloud or the fire if you had to walk more than one day overnight until it came to rest again and then they set up around that space again. This is your life. With these irrefutable reminders or, or these, these very tangible um, experience of life that tells you what? Who do we belong to? God. Who provides for us? God. Who guides us? God. In fact, this period of the people of God, of Israel's history, this period where they're wandering through the wilderness, uh, for 40 years, these tangible signs of God's guidance and His presence and, um, and Him being with His people uh, became important reminders for the, for the rest of, well, everyone who follows God for all time, including down to us today. That's why we're being reminded of it today as we um, uh, uh, look at this uh, experience of God's people uh, through that time. In fact, they, the Israelites, they put some of that manna inside the Ark of the Covenant. God told them to um, keep some of this so that future generations will remember, will remember that I provide, that I am your provider. Now let's read this in Exodus 16. Now the Israelites, they called the food manna. It was white like coriander seed and it tasted like um, honey wafers. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Fill a two-quart container with manna to preserve it for your descendants. Then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set you free from Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna. Then put it in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve it for all future generations. And Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He eventually placed it in the Ark of the Covenant, in front of the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. So the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they arrived at the land where they would settle. And the cloud and the fire are referred to again and again through their travels in Exodus, in Deuteronomy, in Numbers, and in future generations too. Nehemiah, Psalms, Isaiah, you'll see these uh, reminders uh, that the prophets and the, and the psalmists that, the, who, who write the songs about who God is and who we are, and that they're calling back to remember, remember those times where God tangibly um, provided for us in the cloud and in the fire and in the manna. Important messages for the people of God about who we are, who is our provider, who is our guide. 
Now let me ask you this. If, if you had those reminders, if we had these reminders, if every day when you got out of bed, you had to go out and there was just gr- uh, food supernaturally on the ground, and, and above your space, there was a cloud that was always there, a pillar of cloud, and at night it turned to fire every single time. And then when that moved, then you just got up and moved with it. And then wherever you moved, there would be food on the ground every morning. It wasn't there before you moved, but it kind of goes with the cloud. Like, Do you think if you lived that kind of existence, um, it would be easier to remember that you belong to God, that He is the provider, and that He's your guide? It sounds like it would be easier, but... Israel's experience was, nah, they just got used to it and they chucked all kinds of wobblies and, and they had lots of problems with their leaders and they got angry at God and they rejected Him and they found lots of other things to occupy their brains and they worshipped and trusted and depended on everything but God. Even though they had the cloud and the fire and the food every day, day you know that for all they had we have more we don't have manna to eat and things in the sky to look at what do we have we have the holy spirit inside us like god is not external to us we don't even have to turn our head to see him he is living inside us if you have trusted your life to god if if you if you are a child of god if you have given your life to god if he is your if you have surrendered who you are and said yes god i want your way and not my way and i believe that jesus christ died and rose again for me if you have if you are in this life with god the holy spirit is inside you God's presence is living within us, not external to us, in us. Here's how we know who we are. Jesus said this in John 14. He said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive him because it isn't looking for him. It doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives in Uh, Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you'll see me. Since I live, you will also live. And after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out, as Jesus had said. And here's the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. He says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. That's an intimate term that means, we don't have a word for it, Dad, like Father, but with all that kind of uh, respect and intimacy. Like I know you and you know me and we're in relationship and, and we just connect heart to heart. Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit the Apostle Paul says, his spirit, his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. See, the Hebrew child might glance at the fire in the sky, but you and I merely turn our attention to God and say, Father, and his spirit affirms deep within our core that we are his child. God's presence is inside of us. Do you wake up and know it? Do we take time to remember each day that we belong to Him? And that before every other role we have, we're His. I mean, maybe you're a dad and a husband and an employee or a wife or, or a boss um, or a daughter or a son or a friend or a, a mate or a neighbor or a house owner or a an investor, I don't whatever other role you have in life, first and foremost, you are a child of God. Before you are anything, you are a child of God. It is who we are. 
It is our identity. And we are reminded of it every single day if we will just turn our attention to Him who lives inside of us. And our provider. These are uncertain times. And uh, people are asking, what's this going to mean for us economically, both personally but also nationally? What's going to happen to our economy? Um, who's going to provide for us? The economic stage across the whole world is shifting, actually. And, um, and it's very difficult to know. I don't know what kind of uh, world our kids are going to live in when they're our age economically. How do we know we're going to be provided for? Jesus said this in Matthew 6. So don't worry about these things. Saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. See, God provides the earth we stand on, the air we breathe, the bodies we occupy. He gave you your intelligence and your work ethic and your common sense. He made us. He made you. Uh, he made me. He knows what we need. If we're able to work, we should work. That's God's gift to us. That's God's provision for us. If we're getting JobKeeper or some other payment from um, government for our sustenance, that's awesome. That, that's God's provision because he owns everything. God's providing for us. And this is important. When we have more than we need, that is God trusting us to look after those who don't have enough. Um, lots of people I've heard, well, lots, when you say lots and you mean you've spoken to half a dozen people. So about six people that I've spoken to received, you know, remember when we got that $750 grant? Those of us um, that have any kind of government payment. So if, if you're a carer and you receive a carer's payment, um, <coughs> which is why we got it, so you, get, you, get, you got this just lump sum $750 um, that fell in a few places. Now, quite a few people who got that don't need it. They, they don't need the extra. Uh, they didn't need it. And so what a lot of us did, or a lot, what six of us did, <laughs> was, <coughs> uh, was we, were, we prayed, God, I've got this, it's extra, I don't need it. So um, who can this go to? Who does need it? And then we pass it straight on. One of the ways that God provides for us is through his church, through his people. Um, through the love that he, he puts inside all of our hearts for each other so that if we have more than we need, we're happy to help those who don't have enough. So I would encourage us here, don't worry about provision because God is our provider. And don't hoard wealth. Seek first the kingdom of God. Look to God. Trust him as our provider and our guide. And our guide is anyone feeling secure and certain about the future right now. I'm not. We've got, we've got aggressive social agendas um, driven by our politicians here. We've got big cultural movements that clash against each other across the world. We've got polarizing worldviews that are um, tearing the West apart, really. We've got big shifts in economic landscapes. You know, we worry about what kind of world our kids are walking into. But then you talk to some young adults and the questions that they're asking, they're not even the same questions <coughs> that we'd ask. They're not, they're not the same worries that we have. They're, they're talking about justice and equity and refugees and poverty and, and prejudice and privilege and all these things that we didn't worry about when we were their age. But they've got new questions, different questions, different concerns. Every generation um, has a different concern. And it seems that that's accelerating even more so now. Uh, I'm only 47. My kids are just emerging adults now and they have a very different set of questions that I had um, when I was their age too. The world is rapidly changing. How do we guide the next generation into, in, in the way that they should follow Jesus in their space, it, into what their worldview should be, into what they should think? Here's the answer. We can't. We can't because we don't know what they'll face. What we can do is introduce them to the one who can guide them. What we can do is teach them to trust the one who is their guide. And that is God, through his Holy Spirit, living in them. He is our guide. He alone knows the way forward. 
He knows beginning from beginning to end. Psalm 25 says, The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He teaches the humble in doing right, teaching them His way. So we look up at night and we don't see a fiery cloud, but we're in the presence of God and we can ask, God, guide me, guide us. Where should I go? Who should we help? How should I love? James says, if any of you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Uh, When we got that uh, 750 payment um, to our family, um, it was more than we needed. Um, Now, who hates getting extra money? Like, I don't know anyone who fears a pay rise. Right? Like we, we, that's not a scary thing for us. But when you get it and you don't need it and you want wisdom with that and you ask God. Now, we, I didn't really want to ask God, but we did. We asked God and he told us, give it here. Give it to that person. Or break it up and give it there and there. Because, he, because when we ask God for wisdom, he's generous. He wants us to understand what he wants to do in our lives. He wants to guide us. Uh, And so we can ask. The biggest block for us hearing God, there's lots of questions about God's guidance and I'm happy to have a a longer conversation with you about all of the nuances in that space, but I promise you this, the biggest block in us being guided by God is getting ourselves out of the way. The biggest block hurdle that we have to overcome in hearing God's voice or, or, or trying to find out what God wants us to do is surrendering our own agenda, like laying down our own wants, putting aside our own desires and saying, God, just guide me, show me what you want, show me what, who, who you want me to love and show me what you want me to do. And God, everything I have is yours. All of this resource that I have is yours. All this time I have is yours. All of the capabilities I have, all the giftedness I have, it's all yours, God. Guide me. Guide me. Show me where to go next. If you pray those prayers to God, if you surrender your life to God, He will guide you. He loves to give us wisdom. He will not rebuke you for asking. He is generous. And His love for us is unending. And and He wants us to trust Him. And he knows that this is the best thing for us, for our lives, that we learn to trust him. So, identity, provision, and guidance. At all times, but especially in these uncertain times, I wanted to remind us and encourage us to keep looking to God. He gives us our identity. He provides for us. He guides us. We're going to close with a song now. And I want this to be our prayer together, this song. Father, I trust you and I'm available. The song is about availability. This is the prayer that I would like. Father, I trust you. I'm available. I'm your child. I belong to you. I trust you to provide for me. I'm available. Whatever I have, God, I give to you. I'm available. So I encourage you to to either sing this with us or listen and reflect. But may our hearts, may our hearts echo this cry to God. God, I trust you. I'm available. Amen.
When we recorded that song, those words were so real. And those words were my prayer. And I have to say, I felt a greater peace during that moment than I had for a while. So I want to encourage you, pray that prayer. Put your trust in God today, in his presence, in his provision for us, and in knowing that he will be our guide. If you've heard something today that might have challenged you, maybe it's inspired you, maybe you just want to know a little more, I encourage you to contact us. Pete or Danny or I would be happy to talk with you, to pray with you. Or perhaps today you've been praying those words. You've been saying, yep, God, I hear you. I'm available. I trust you. I encourage you to tell someone, talk to someone about that. It's uh, much harder to forget when you share it with someone. And if you don't have someone there, give someone a call, send a text, uh, or perhaps contact us if you're needing to work through that. But I pray that this week will be a good one for you. And when I say that, I mean a good one where you seek to trust God more and know God more. So go out and have a great week.
Thanks. Thank you.